it's a lot of fun to hunt turkeys and and you love it, but it's sort of a means to a bigger end as far as right. scouting, uh, you know, scouting for deer spots, scouting out west, doing that kind of stuff. And so I, w- I want to talk about that because that's a strategy that I use all the time. And I know I know from talking to you in the past, and I interviewed you for an article one time where every every single piece of public land I brought up between you and the Canadian border, you were like, oh, I've been in there. I turkey hunted in there. I've been in there. <laughs> and you, you must use turkey hunting to cover an awful lot of ground and check out a bunch of public dirt. Absolutely. Uh, I, I didn't turkey hunt most of my life because, you know, I just wouldn't have walked across the street for turkey, to tell you the truth. I was an antler aficionado, you know, true bow hunters are, have antler fetishes and So as I got older and got more time, you know, not only can I kill a few more birds with one stone by turkey hunting a little bit in the spring, but mainly I get a tremendous amount of extra scouting in that I used to not do. In the early days of my life, I had to work like a dog seven days a week all through the springtime, and I just didn't have time to scout for deer or turkey hunt. So that's one of the blessings of, you know, getting a little older and having a little more time but my, my, my main focus really when I go turkey hunting, honestly, is looking for new places to bow hunt in the fall for deer. Mm-hmm. And you, but you're bow hunting turkeys too, right? I do. I bow hunt them. I, I, I can't fathom. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I, I can't fathom hunting them with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that would be way, way against the rules. I mean, it's bad enough with if you do it right with a bow, you know, a blind and decoy, it's pretty much a massacre. But um, I I do harvest a few birds each year and eat them and enjoy them. They're, they're one of the most magnificent things. I love to watch a strut and gobbler come in, you know. Mm-hmm. But I'm getting a little tender hearted as I get older and I'm kind of getting a little bit less likely to want to, you know, just be a, wiping them all out either. So yep. I've slowed down instead of killing five a year, I usually try to just kill a couple. Yep. So, well, I wanted to ask you about that with, with the bow hunting thing, because I primarily bow hunt them too, but I, I find myself, if I have a tag somewhere that I really want to scout deer. So, so last year for me, this was Iowa, cause I'm going to draw my Iowa tag this year. So I thought I'm going to go run a gun with a shotgun cause I'll cover way more ground. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I drew a turkey tag down there again this year, and I'm going to draw my deer tag this fall. And so I'm kind of wrestling with that because I don't really want to go shotgun hunt. But I know if I if I bow hunt turkeys, I, I usually cover less ground. And so yeah. I, I'm kind of I kind of wrestle with that. Like I don't, I don't I, I've killed a lot of turkeys with a shotgun in my life. I'm kind of over that. But at the same time, it'll be more beneficial to me to carry a shotgun than a bow. But I want to carry a bow more. Well, I understand that. Give you know the run and gun is definitely a ground cover. And when you bow hunt, usually going in first really productive spots, you just camp on it, you know, and you don't, you, you're not going to get as much scouting. You're not going to find shed antlers doing that. But well, if you've got the time, I usually have time. That's one of my greatest assets. Now that I'm older, I have time that a lot of people don't. I'm not in a hurry. I usually go to a property that I'm going to turkey hunt. And the first thing I do is I just literally get out there all day the first day and I beat that property down to a pulp i will look it over from one corner to the other that way i'm not only absorbing all the deer info or finding sheds you know i also figure out where i'm going to set up with my bow so i go in and even though a bow hunt a turkey i will cover the property thoroughly mm-hmm. for a, you know daylight till dark and so i can pretty well learn everything i want to about a piece of ground and still you know just bow hunt it for mm-hmm. turkey do you, do you ever set up? Cause I, I kind of do the same thing too, where I just want to, I want to see it all. And you know, if you blow turkeys out or something like that, they're, you, you can be on right. them the next day. It's, it doesn't have the same effect as it might on deer or other big game, but do you, right. do you ever set up? Um, I, I, I find in some places I go, especially if I'm getting more into the plain States, I set up my turkey blind sometimes with the idea that I should be able to see a lot of deer too. And yeah. once in a while, when I'm watching those deer in the spring do something, going from you know food to bed, bed to food, or something like that, it clues me into something in the fall that I've used to my advantage to kill deer. And it kind of it's it's kind of an aspect of this process that we don't think about as much because you're talking about antlers and looking at sign and seeing the terrain and the typical kind of scouting that we would assume and i think there are people out there who would listen to this and go well me seeing deer do something in april doesn't mean anything 
in September, October, or November. But I found that's not entirely true. No, not at all. It is. I mean, you got to absorb the whole picture. And, you know, if it's a very mobile food source that they're dealing with, that's one thing. You know, plantings of crops are going to change and the deer are going to move a lot, maybe. But if it's natural movement patterns through corridors or, you know, things like that, then that's that's pretty stable. And that's what I look for. I, I'm real bad about uh, I've always been a deer travel corridor guy. Mm-hmm. I like to kill them in the rut. I'm not nearly as good as you at like killing them early. I never really could afford to be off work early. I had to almost work right up until the day the rut was starting every year, you know, and I would take off and then go on my binge. So I didn't get an opportunity to do what I call early season whitetail, October whitetail a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm not an expert at killing them early. I I think you know way, way more about that than I do. But uh, no, if you see them moving, you know, from all over through their habitat in the spring, most of the time that that's pretty valuable information unless they're just on a very finite food source that's going to be gone and, and be altered. If it's a, if it's big, you know, natural habitat and they're moving through it, they'll be there in the fall. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's one thing I picked up. You know, I used to edit your stuff when I was at Peterson's bow hunting a long time ago. And you know, I was taking in information from Bill Winky and you and some of the other guys, Pat Mateen and some of these other guys who were writing for bow hunting a lot. And your strategy, you know, you had a love for scouting and that was obvious, but there was also this observation, uh, this emphasis on observation that seemed to be built into an awful lot of your whitetail hunting. And I just didn't see that with other people the same way. There was more of a reliance on trail cameras and, you know, bringing deer to a food plot or something. And your thing a lot of times seemed to be like, man, I'm getting out there and I'm watching. And if I see those deer using, you know, right. going through this patch of cedars 500 yards away, I'm moving my butt in there. I'm not going to sit there right. and try to get them to me. Well, you know, that's one thing I will say I'm proud of is that from the time I got to be a really good whitetail hunter up until I almost had peaked in a way and was over the hill almost by the time a lot of the new technology come in. I didn't have trail cameras. I didn't have, I I come from an era where trail cameras weren't around really. And even when they come in the first, say, half dozen years or more, I didn't use them. Uh, I didn't bait. I didn't food plot. I didn't manage. I didn't use GPSs. I mean, I was a little redneck, hit the ground learn the habitat, the topography, the animal, put it all together and just plain scout and hunt, fair chase the old fashioned way. And I am proud of that. Uh, I can hunt them with or without any of this modern crap, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not saying this stuff ain't good nowadays. It probably does make it easier, but you know, at what cost? I mean, is that the only goal is to make everything easier, you know? Yep. Uh, not really. If you're a real hardcore bow hunter, you want satisfaction of pulling something out of nothing, you know? Yep. Well, that's, you know, we, we get into that topic a lot that easy isn't necessarily better. No. And we've, you know, in in our world, we, we have it really easy. I mean, yep. we just have it easier than society's ever had it before, and we're not any happier. No. And so we know that like, okay, this, this, even though it's nice to have, you know, flip a light switch and have light come on and have right. hot water and all this stuff. We also know that easy just doesn't necessarily equate to happiness. And I think this is one of the biggest things in the, in the bow hunting world or the hunting world is we think the trail cameras and the food plots and all of this stuff that are, that should theoretically be the shortest route from no dead deer to a dead deer, make it better but you can see an awful lot of people go that route who aren't happy. And then right. now you're seeing this movement. I was thinking about this before, when we talked the other day after we got off the phone. I'm like, man, Eddie Claypool was maybe just 25 years too early. Because if, yeah. you, were, if you were, you know, peaking right now with this public land movement and all of this, you know, people are kind of swung back to the woodsmanship and this idea that you can learn boots on the ground and you got to be out there like you're talking about. I mean, you were doing that before anybody was even, th- the industry was going the opposite way of that and wasn't going to arc back for two decades. And now here yeah. we are and you're sitting here saying, Hey yeah. man, I was doing, <laughs> yeah. I was doing well, this. You know, that's one thing I'm proud of too, is the fact that I didn't buy into all this big, uh, 
video and high tech movement that started around 20 years ago. And I got kind of blackballed by the industry a lot because of that. Um, I'm a square peg. I don't fit into the round hole too well. But, you know, if it is coming back around to that, uh, I'm proud of that. And I'm glad that I held out and didn't sell out and become a a technology um, ego centric, uh, you know, maniac about it. Uh, I, I believe I'm a down to your roots guy. I represent the American public. I, I'm not trying to be a TV star. I, I wouldn't be one if I could. I could have been one. I don't yep. have it. I want to be the average Joe that does it. I know how the average Joe. I've been it. I worked all my life, seven days a week. I've worked up till 530 on Friday and get laid off and be in a tree stand 800 miles away the next morning at daylight. I mean, I did it the hardcore way. I've slept in a pickup bed at zero degrees. I mean, I have I'm proud of the fact that I did it as hardcore as it can be done. And now that, you know, I'm a little older, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm getting a little bit sissified and I do it a little easier. I do. But I'm also wiser. So, you know, the results are very similar. I just pick and choose my battles a little better now and make better decisions. And I I don't have to hunt seven days a week now. Um, I enjoy myself a lot more and then pick and choose a hunt in the right place at the right time and try to get the job done, you know, but yeah, I am proud that I held out and didn't get involved in all this new high tech, uh, sell your soul. And so there I am, same place I was 20 years ago. There's, there's a, it's a hard thing to explain to people. You know, if you look at what's happening in hunting right now and the numbers we're losing and the people who are dropping out, you, everybody wants to point a finger somewhere, right? And right. so they're, they, you know, it's, it's really easy to blame the hunting industry and, the people who were most successful are kind of the lightning rods and they, they took that TV route and without question, they, they do share some of the blame. I get it. We, you know, we've been around this a long time, but what you don't see is nobody's pointing a finger at all these, you know, archery companies, these manufacturers who are sitting there saying, you know, they created these monsters and the demands got higher and higher and higher on these TV people. And there's, you know, nobody thinks, oh, the bow company that I love, they're they're not responsible for this downturn in hunters or creating this, uh, you know, have to kill big bucks at any cost kind of mentality or fill a TV right. show with three dead deer every week. But there's a lot of blame to go around there. And there's a lot of things behind the scenes that I'm sure you saw and I've seen where it's like, man, you know, that I, I get some of these people got into these roles with the TV and the outdoor television and, you know, that becomes their job and their career. And now your boss, who's your, you know, the sponsors, they're saying, you're going to do more. You're not getting this check. And every right. year you're doing more and you're giving yourself more away. And so some of these people, I think they got into it with good intentions and, you know, you can't see the future. You couldn't know what no. was coming, but there's, there's more blame to go around. And I know you and I are hated by some of the same companies. And <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> well, I don't. I don't know if we're hated, but we just, we sure don't feel necessary to them anymore. They went a different route. They've sold out to the, you know, the new wave and all of that. And that's their business, but they are a lot responsible. They're the ones that set a lot of standards for where we're at right now. And, uh, you know, it, there's nothing new under the sun, really. But this, this new hunting phase of video and all this high tech is new. Um, and it's a cycle that everybody had to go through. And I mean, back in the day when their top end bows were four hundred dollars, maybe you know, five hundred for a very top end cutting edge bow, and then ten, twelve years later, they're fifteen hundred dollars, and and you know, it's a vicious cycle that I really thought they would be smarter about. They really didn't show me that they had much more sense than I do. They they had to learn the hard way, and and. You know, it, it's it's bit them in the rear, and I don't know where it's going to go. I, I've said for a long time it's going to implode and go back, but I don't know if it will or not. I, it wouldn't hurt us all if we regressed a little bit, honestly, in my book. But I'm from old school. I got to see things that literally I lived through a hunting bow hunting time that people that are like about 30 years or even 35 or so and younger right now don't even know existed. They don't even know it existed. They never experienced none of what I have experienced. 
So I have a little bit different outlook, and I don't know that things will ever get the way they were because, like you, but you know, you said hunter numbers are down and everything. Well, that might be the case, but everywhere I go and everything I do, they're way, way up with what I'm doing. You know, trying to access public land elk and across the counter tags. It's a dang freak show nowadays. For sure. If, you, if you're if you a public land bow hunter, yeah. it does not feel like we're losing numbers no. overall. But when, when you look at the the general firearms numbers in a bunch of these stronghold whitetail states, we're losing numbers. Yeah. And the one thing that's holding steady is bow hunting. If uh-huh. you look at all these little subsets of the waterfowl hunters yeah. and the upland hunters, uh, we're, there's an attrition rate going on there. We're holding steady with bow hunting. And so it does feel like, I mean, I feel the same way. I see more people yeah, yeah. <laughs> on public land, you know, and part of it is public land's popular. And, you know, like we share some of the blame with that because we've shown people. That, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you know, know, it's an information age and it's all out there now. Everybody's got their finger in the kitty, you know, like th- just this right here is informing people how to do it or, and where and everything and with all the technology anybody can put their finger on it google earth and you name it i mean the information that wasn't there 20 years ago a beginner can access it right now and and he'll start out at a level that it took me 10 or 20 years to get to you know by putting boots on the ground and i understand it ain't never going to go away but and really it's putting a lot of strain on game and fish departments i'm sure to manage it so we get them a lot more technical, a lot more in depth. And then we have, you know, game and fish regs that are 200 pages long that you can't keep track of. Every single state is like, I can't keep track of all this. I'm going to be violating the law and not even know it, you know it. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know. I'm just like ready to fade into the horizon and kind of go do my, my thing in the little quiet spaces and uh, just be, you know, uh, Left alone, I'm, I'm not really interested in fighting the system anymore. I'm kind of burned out. I, the last 20 years, I've watched it, and I'm kind of – I'm ready just to have some quiet times alone. So uh, on that note – what I know you're all fired up, but what what brings you happiness now? Like what what have you learned at this stage in your life where you're like, I want to go hunt that, fish for that, do this, and this this at the end of the day, I feel good about doing. What is it for you? Okay, well that's pretty easy. I've been looking at that a lot lately because I think maybe you know I've always heard there's like five stages of outdoorsmanship if you get to mature through all of them, and I I'm kind of thinking I'm betting that I probably I'm one of the rare people that's going to get to go through all five of them because I, I have done this hardcore for 45 years. And I mean, I have not never worked a single fall in my life. I've always took off three to four months every year and just disappeared into the woods. So very few people have got to spend the kind of time outdoors that I do, you know. So I think I'm mm-hmm. going into that fifth, fifth and final stage right now where they call it the sportsmanship stage. And it's not so much anymore about all that stuff, even stage four was about trophies and killing big stuff and learning it and getting good at it, right? Well, now mm-hmm. what I'm getting really, really interested in is quiet, wide open spaces and looking at just off the map, dirt, uh, exploring, uh, trying to find little diamonds in the rough that the mainstream hasn't overturned yet. So I'm going to go, you know, my days of going to the big shot places uh, are over. I'm going to start going off into the little uh, bits of habitat that may not really be the best hunting for trophies for sure. But I don't have to have trophies anymore. I'm happy, you know, just to kill a representative animal. And Mm -hmm. if it's a quiet, peaceful hunt and uh, wide open spaces, uh, I'm happy. So my I'm going to that stage of just enjoying my outing, mainly the outing. Mm-hmm. It's not about ending up with a trophy. It, it's always been to me about, I've been bad for 40 years about wanting to kill a trophy animal. And I will still harvest one if he comes by and everything, but it doesn't, it does not um, make or break me anymore. I just have a good time by going to little uh, places that I haven't been that I don't think other people really, I drive back roads and check out, you know, all the places that aren't really on the map yet. You know what I mean? And uh, mm-hmm. that's what blows my skirt up is that's why I've probably been to so many of them places you talked about, you know, <laughs> you know, well, man, I, I feel a similar motivation in my life right now to where I just want to, I don't, 
I'm not, I'm not into the big stuff anymore either. I, right. I, you know, I, I like it if they come by, sure, but I'm not. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking right. for a place other people aren't going to go, and I okay. want to go spend many days there. And there you go. I've been, you know, we've been talking about this more and more on this podcast. I know you've done this a ton, and I'm really. I'm really starting to appreciate the solo trips where, you know, I've, I've done them out of necessity. Cause like you, not everybody gets the time off that we do to go travel. So it's a lot of times right. you just, you just go on your own and right. there's something about being responsible for your, the own pace of your day and your own decisions. Mm-hmm. And you come back to camp and you eat a sandwich or you do, you, it's just you. And it's you walking mm-hmm. out in the morning for the entire day. And it, like, I, there, I love not having to factor anyone else. And it, maybe it makes me sound selfish, but you know, when you got little kids at home and you got a yeah. job and wife and the whole thing, when you walk out into that woods and you have five, six, seven, eight days where it's just you, it's, right. it's, you learn something about yourself and you feel, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm doing something right. Like I feel like this is something I have to do in my life. Yeah. Well, that sounds, that's great because you voiced a lot of who I am. I don't know how many people are, are made up this way, but, and I don't think, you know, I've been told all my life that I'm a heel and I'm irresponsible and I'm a no good because, you know, you're supposed to stay around 52 weeks a year and do your blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, you know, do that. But I think a man deserves a little bit of time to reflect and meditate on life. Some of his, your best times are when you're out there in the middle of nowhere, walking across the prairie or maybe you're hiking up to Timberline in the dark one morning, you know. I mean, a guy deserves it. If a, if a woman and a family and friends could get a grasp that the guy, you know, giving them a week to do that every once in a while is going to be of great benefit. It's a great investment for them. They'll find out that it's you know, instead of harping on them, you know, you know and griping at them and, and running them down for it, they might actually get some really good French French benefits from it, you know, yeah. and I, I'm from that class. I don't know how many people are like us that have to do that, but I, I've often made the statement even 40 years ago that I'm going bow hunting for a while and I'm going to enjoy some wide open spaces. If I have to hitchhike naked backwards to get there, I'm going, you know, now just give me my little bit of time and I'm going to be back and I'm going to be a good man. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But don't, beat me into submission 52 weeks a year. I'm going to break. I'm going to lose my mind. I've got, I don't know if I, if I'm a weirdo, but I've got to have some time to myself to meditate on life, reflect on, you know, my creator and just try to get my head on straight. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, I think, I think what you're saying there, I think everybody probably needs that. I think a lot of people, maybe don't get into a position to recognize they need it. And That's I, it. That's I think it. we're in a, we're in a place where it's very easy to fill your life up with stuff and not do anything for yourself or not, right. not, not really do anything beneficial for yourself. And we go down this road all the time on this podcast. I think if you get over, you know, anybody listening to this, it's like, man, I, I've never done a solo trip. I would have never even considered it. Turkey season's coming up, <laughs> you know, yeah, grab your shotgun, you grab go. your blind. I don't care. Do what you want, but take that, that easy, low pressure hunt and go camp for a couple of days by yourself. And you'll, right. you'll see a, a sort of a world open up that is going to be beneficial to you. This stuff Eddie's talking about, about sort of restoring your soul and, and getting your head right. That matters a lot. 